I thought I was muted. <laughs> the MindWalks program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroth Fund and supported by the Central Coast State Parks Association. So if you'd like to help support the virtual mind walks program or any state parks educational programs, uh, please check out the link you see on the screen in blue, centralcoastparks.org backslash friend. And that's where you can make a donation to the Central Coast State Parks Association. Donate $35 or more to become a friend of Central Coast State Parks Association and receive perks such as store discounts and newsletter subscriptions. There are several different programs you can choose to support. And um, by doing so, you'll make a huge impact at our park. So thank you so much for considering that. Now, today we have with us Jenna Bental, and she's gonna present Sharing Space with Sea Otters, a case study of coexistence in a crowded world. <laughs> There's our little otter. <laughs> so a little background on Jenna. Since 2001, she's worked as a sea otter biologist studying sea otters in such wide ranging locations as the Aleutian Islands, Russia's Commander Islands, San Nicolas Island off the coast of Southern California and along the Central California coast. After years of studying sea otters in the wild, Jenna has learned uh, much about their unique biology and behavior and witnessed firsthand the chronic nature of disturbance by human recreation activities. In early 2014, she began to pursue the idea of organizing a program specifically dedicated to alleviating this chronic disturbance through education. Jenna has directed the Sea Otter Savvy program since 2015 and currently serves as president of the board of directors. So we're so happy to have you here with us today. I know everyone's excited about this program. Um, and uh, kind of as usual, we'll be answering questions at the end of the program. So if you think of a question while she's presenting, just go ahead and throw it into the chat so you don't forget, and then we'll, we'll address it there later on. All right, take it away. Okay, let me just get everything set up here. I got to remember to optimize my video. Okay, how's that looking? Are you seeing my full screen? This looks great, yeah. Fantastic, okay. Thank you so much to the Central Coast State Parks Association for inviting me to speak today. And thanks to all of you for joining me. I'm the director of Sea Outer Savvy a nonprofit organization with the mission to use outreach and education to foster community stewardship and reduce human caused disturbance to sea otters. We're working for the most part to resolve human caused, um, excuse me, resolve conflict over space between sea otters and people. As I have grown with sea otter savvy over the last six years or so, I've learned a lot, uh, but I still don't know the answers or all of the answers to resolving this conflict. Uh, I saw a promo for, for uh, this talk today and it caused me to have a bit of a, a panic spike in that it implied I'd be sharing the secret of coexistence. Um, but in fact, I'm simply imparting some of what I've learned over the last six years as an example, a case study a case study of a struggle to preserve wildness in a world with an expanding human dominance. It's central question, what kind of neighbors will we be to other species on this planet remains unanswered. So I'd like to start out with a definition, urban wildlife is a term that has been coined to describe wildlife that has adapted their lifestyle to living in the concrete jungles of cities and in suburban neighborhoods. That's from the Urban Wildlife Alliance. And let's hope we never live to see the extreme habituation illustrated by this comic strip. I'll just give it a quick read. The deer is talking to a person across the fence. I don't like to gossip, Vicky, but the raccoons were in your garbage. And have you seen what the bears have done with their den? Tacky. Anywho, I got to go pick up the kids from soccer practice and the woman thinks wildlife are getting way too urbanized. When we hear the term urban wildlife, what species come to mind? 
when you think of urban wildlife, what do you think of? And you can pop some of your, your uh, ideas into the chat. But see, but sea otters as urban wildlife, these symbols of the wild, rugged, inaccessible coasts of Alaska, Russia, or British Columbia, where this photo was taken, for a considerable portion of their current California range, the southern sea otter largely overlaps with human development, dense populations, and high rates of tourism. They are literally surrounded with boats, recreational craft, commercial craft, buildings, agriculture, golf courses, highways, triathlons, regattas, drones, photographers, the list goes on. But what does coexistence mean? One difference between humans and all other life on this planet is that we can choose how to coexist in the world. Sea otters are certainly forced to adapt to us. Their survival depends on it. In a way, will we in turn adapt to them in a way that respects their needs as they resume their place on the North American West Coast. So you've already heard a little bit about me in the introduction, but just to go over it real quick, um, I've spent 20 years working as a sea otter biologist studying wild otters for the US Geological Survey, UC Santa Cruz and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I've spent thousands of hours watching sea otters in places such as San Nicolas Island in Southern California, where I did my graduate research to the more exotic and extremely remote Russian commander islands to right here on the central coast where tracking is a, a lot less rugged and there's always an espresso less than five minutes away. All this time spent studying otters has resulted in a couple things uh, relevant to my work for sea otter savvy. It's, it's left me with a fair amount of savvy when it comes to sea otters. I, I consider myself fairly sea otter savvy, although I'm still learning. And it's left me frustrated by how relentlessly sea otters are disturbed by our recreation activities. While I tracked wild sea otters, I inevitably encountered disturbance. I would be filled with dread approaching some sites, uh, knowing I would probably witness disturbance to a mom with a small pup or a tagged female I knew was recovering from just rearing and weaning one. It was difficult to witness and difficult to combat. I confess I did a lot of yelling in those days, a, a technique that we have abandoned from the start with Sea Otter Savvy. But I, I understand the frustration behind the yelling in a world where it can sometimes be a struggle to feel like you have any power to make a difference. Maybe there's not much we can do to keep white sharks from biting sea otters. And that's the number one cause of mortality uh, for sea otters in California, by the way. But the simple act of giving them space is one thing we can do to make the world a better, safer, and more peaceful place for sea otters. So here are some components of the case study, characteristics of otters and some elements of how humans perceive them that are part of the coexistence equation. Characteristics of sea otters, they are recovering species, they're exceptionally vulnerable to human disturbance, and they live close to shore. From some human behavioral elements, uh, sea otters are accessible to humans. Humans find them charismatic. Uh, they can be profitable to humans, and they are also seen as a competitor. Wherever they are recovering, sea otters are perceived as competitors for both food and space. But keep in mind, when it comes to food, one is competing to meet their survival demands, and the other is competing, with a few exceptions in the case of subsistence foragers, for a livelihood. This is an hour-long topic in and of its own, and since Sea Otter Savvy focuses more on conflict over space, primarily in largely urbanized California, that is what I'm going to emphasize today. The solutions to conflict over food employ some overlapping principles, but are more complex. Conflict over food tends to center around specialized user groups like shell fisheries, and conflict over space can be relevant to anyone living or visiting the Central California coast. Let's go into a little more depth on each of these. Sea otters are a recovering species. 
Sea otters once ranged continuously throughout the entire North Pacific Rim and from Northern Japan through the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and down the US West Coast into Baja. They were reduced to scattered remnant colonies, these red circles, reddish circles you can see here by the maritime fur trade and have recovered with variable success a portions of their historic range. And I just want to point out here, I don't know, let's see, are you able, hopefully you can see my pointer. These are the commander islands here. And this is the, where I did my field research for three summers. And this is going to be relevant in the next slide. The story of the near extinction of sea otters has its origin in the shipwreck of one of the ships of the Bering Expedition in 1741. The shipwreck ha happened in 1741. The Stellar Sea Cow, also a denizen of the Commander Islands in Russia, was declared extinct by 1768, within 27 years of its discovery by these shipwrecked Europeans. This slow moving and easily caught mammal was hunted into extinction for its meat, fat, and hide. Sea otters didn't fare much better as a result of this Bering expedition, and 1741 ushered in the heyday of the maritime fur trade and sea otter pelts. Hunted relentlessly by maritime fur traders for their luxurious fur, they were reduced in number to just a few thousand worldwide by the end of the 19th century, and received full protection along with the northern fur seals under the International Fur Seal Treaty of 1911. If you're interested in learning more, uh, about this story. I highly recommend the book Where the Sea Breaks Its Back by Corey Ford. And I think we can pop that a link to that book uh, in the chat. And you can also read an account um, of the shipwreck with uh, in Stellar's log of the expedition. So that's also available as a book. Highly recommend both of those. By the time the, Mar the Marine Mammal Protection Act was enacted in 1972, the California population had grown from as few as 50 to more than 1,000 individuals, an average annual growth rate of about 5%, and had recolonized more than 200 miles of the California coast. Today, its range is principally along the Central California coast from Pigeon Point, which is just north of Santa Cruz to Point Conception and San Nicolas Island out there by itself out here. Um, and the population has been hovering around 3,000 with stalled expansion to the north and south, which is another topic I won't have time to cover today. So this is a heat map. Uh, you can see these yellow and orange colors. This shows the range of the southern sea otter. And where densities are highest, um, you can see it's, it's redder, more, more orange. And this is considered to be the range center where sea otter densities are highest. It's been recolonized the longest. And if we carry the range map over, we can see that the southern sea otter has recovered only a small portion of its pre fur trade um, numbers or its pre fur trade uh, um, habitat on the California coast. And that's a famous historic picture of the origin point for southern sea otter recovery off the coast of Big Sur. Southern sea otters were listed as threatened in 1977 under the Endangered Species Act due primarily to reduced range, population size, um, vulnerability to oil spills, and oil spill risk from coastal tanker traffic. As a result of their threatened status, Southern sea otters are also recognized as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and under state law, southern sea otters are fully protected mammals. And additionally, in 2015, uh, a five-year report on the southern sea otter uh, the US, produced by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, they identified human-caused disturbance as an additional threat. Why are sea otters exceptionally vulnerable? Among marine mammals, they are exceptionally vulnerable to the effects of disturbance. Uh, there is a term used in animal physiology, which describes species as capital spenders versus savers. In the two photos shown here, can you guess which is the spender and which is the saver? How are they saving and why are they spending? 
Remember the range center I indicated on the map a few slides ago. Well, it's not unusual to see very thin sea otters like this female here in the center of the California range. Next time you're at otter spotting, keep an eye out for visible spine and pelvis when a sea otter dives. Sea otters have the highest metabolic mass, or sorry, mass specific metabolic rate of any marine mammal. They don't store fat as blubber as other marine mammal species do, and they're a relatively recent addition to the marine environment. They don't have the same length of evolutionary time as cetaceans and pinnipeds in, in the marine environment. Rather, sea otters have to rely on their dense fur and metabolic rate for maintaining their in, internal body temperature. Their fur is the densest of any mammal, and, they, and it has barbs that connect the hairs of the undercoat and create an air pocket around them, making sure warm air stays close to their skin so cold water does not penetrate. So the main takeaway is that sea otters are constantly burning through energy and they're inefficient at laying on fat in a way that is able to store energy. The stacked figure at right are results from a long-term data collection by sea otter savvy. This 12 hour typical day runs from seven in the morning till seven at night and the, um, is based on data from five years of weekly sessions across seven different Central Coast study sites. So um, these figures each have, let's see, let's get my cursor over here. So proportion of otters active here in the top figure on the y-axis and then you can see that time scale that's carried through all three of these figures. The red jagged line is the typical proportion of otters active if there are no stimuli present. And I use the word stimuli to represent anything that might cause a change in behavior in a sea otter. So we're typically talking about paddle craft, small boats, people on shore, um, eco tour boats, just about anything, even, even sea lions. Um, and so without any of those factors present, this red line represents a pretty normal um, activity profile for a typical sea otter on a typical day. And again, this is derived from our five year uh, data set, uh, sea otter savvy data set. The, the turquoise line here represents the spikes in that probability of activity when stimuli are present. And you can see we have this particular, um, particularly large spike that is predicted right at the time when most sea otters are settling down to rest late morning um, from their early morning foraging bouts. So the space in between this spike with stimuli and the red line with no stimuli is the cost, is the energetic cost. And that's shown right here in this next figure, the in instantaneous cost in joules, uh, it's the energy cost for sea otters. And then down here, this accumulates throughout the day. So by the end of the day, each of these spikes is not isolated. It accumulates as an excess energy cost that a sea otter has to bear in addition to the other costs uh, that it has, that it needs to, um, to survive on a daily basis. So these are all activities that are necessary sur for survival. They have to groom, they have to take care of their pups, they have to swim between foraging areas and resting areas. And the only way they're getting energy in is in the form of the prey items that you see. And by going out and actually finding and diving for those prey items, they aren't delivered to them by DoorDash. They have to expend a lot of energy in order to get that food. So if you add, and then recuperative rest is an extremely important time for them where their body temperature raises as they digest their food and they conserve energy. You add on top of all of these important behaviors that they have to do every day regardless, repeated disturbance to this rest usually causes them to swim and dive to avoid the source of the disturbance. It's a, a very energetically expensive behavior for sea otters. It's the luxury tax of the sea otter's income. It hurts and it's unnecessary. It's like when you're making ends meet, paycheck to paycheck, and your car breaks down, requiring funds that you have not been able to save up for. That is the cost of disturbance for sea otters, and it's chronic throughout the central California coast. Human perspective. Sea otters are accessible to people. 
Characteristics of sea otters place them in proximity to humans include their near shore dwellers, their shallow divers. They favor habitats where humans live, work, forage, and play. They're proximate to human development and very accessible. There are a number of places throughout the Southern Sea Otter's current range where important sea otter habitat and favored marine recreational opportunities overlap. And in these places, interactions between otters and humans are inevitable. Those are my two sisters, by the way, observing in a very sea otter savvy manner. Their accessibility is compounded by what, by what I refer to as the sea otters publicity problem. These animals are undeniably charismatic in their appearance and behavior. Dare I use the C word, cute. While they certainly have their detractors, those numbers are vastly overwhelmed by their fans and travelers to the Central Coast are often specifically seeking out sea otter viewing opportunities. And unfortunately, some are seeking out interactions or images to replicate uh, what they've seen on social media. Hand in hand with their charisma is their benefit to tourism related businesses that capitalize on their accessibility. Sea otters are demonstrably money makers for communities. Their recovery throughout their global range has prompted investigation of their economic, not to mention ecological impact on communities. This is a recent publication from 2020 by Gregor et al about the um, cascading social ecological costs and benefits of sea otters recovering into certain areas in the Pacific Northwest. Recommended reading. There's a flip side to everything though, and we are currently investigating the impact of increased numbers of recreational users in bounded habitat like Elkhorn Slough on the frequency of sea otter disturbance. Numbers in outdoor areas spiked as people turned to outdoor activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Elkhorn Slough was no exception. So this is a time-lapse video here. This segment is just a few weeks after Basically, everyone was shut down, locked down, May of 2020, and then we jump to Labor Day weekend 2020, after everyone was starting to come out into the outdoors. So we have Sea Otter Savvy is working with Mossy Earth and Defenders of Wildlife on a study in progress um, examining the impact of user increases in user numbers on frequency of disturbance. So stay tuned until this time uh, next year for results. So charisma plus accessibility plus, plus profitability plus social media and the selfie culture, which I firmly believe is, has, bears a strong responsibility for uh, the increased level of disturbance to sea otters and people just getting too close to get that selfie or that photo, that wildlife photography quality photo with their iPhone. We do have a sub um, research, pro pro a research project in progress that is looking at the uh, frequency in which we find cell phones or other cameras being used when people approach within a certain distance to sea otters. So again, something to stay tuned for results. It's very, very frequent that the people approaching the closest to sea otters are, uh, have their, are viewing them through their phone. And I'm just going to real quick show you my Instagram scroll of shame. So I collect these photos in my Instagram account. Oops. Where are you going to? There we go. And I collect them into one folder. And you can see one thing in common with all of these photos. They're very, very commonly of disturbed sea otters on social media reacting to the presence of the photographer. And I'm, I really try to promote this message of discretion in sharing and favoring sea otter photos. So think about the next time you go to click like on a sea otter photo, 
does it look like they're responding to the presence of the photographer in a disturbed manner? So here's the mix up, the formula. They're recovering species. They're charismatic. They're accessible to humans. They're exceptionally vulnerable. And you add human behavior into that mix and the result is disturbance. So let's bring back this question and remind ourselves of the luxury of choice. The difference between humans and all other life on this planet is we can choose how to coexist in the world. Awareness is the first, but not the only step towards coexistence. Awareness can include a lot of things. Awareness of the vulnerability of sea otters, their natural history, their history as a recovering species. Awareness of human disturbance. What does disturbance look like? What cost does it have to sea otters? What can I do to prevent it? Awareness of one's own environmental identity. I'll talk about that more in an upcoming slide. We believe awareness is so important we have a whole week dedicated to it. Sea Otter Awareness Week is, is the last week of September every year. Sea Otter Savvy requires that our tool for bringing awareness outreach be founded in science. So we not only keep up with the most up-to-date research, but we conduct our own to better understand disturbance and track disturbance trends. Our data collection sessions or scan sessions are conducted by volunteers, some of whom are on on this webinar here today, thank you, students and interns of the Seattle Savvy program at sites throughout the Central California coast. Seattle Savvy began collecting data in 2015. The scans are done through all seasons, um, time, different times of day and throughout the week. One of the objectives of our research was to investigate how distance and location, site location, influenced the impact of disturbance. This figure illustrates the concept that you, the stimuli, in this case, a kayaker, gets, uh, as you get closer, there is a gradient of behavior change for sea otters. So there are potential disturbance thresholds and zones. On the y-axis, we have the um, relative effect on activity state, and that's the probability that a sea otter will be disturbed versus the stimuli distance here on the x-axis and it's shown, so here we have zero all the way up to 100 meters. So it's expressed in meters. So as that kayak gets closer and closer along the x-axis, we can see potential for sea otter disturbance increase and a change in their behavior. It increases exponentially and we can isolate inflection points along this threshold to help generate graphics. And they can be distributed, those graphics that we're able to generate using those data can be distributed to businesses and partners as a tool to increase awareness and assist marine recreation businesses with customer orientation, especially when paired with a verbal orientation. Uh, graphics like this can convey information to those who may not have known, may have been unaware about the potential of their um, impact to sea otters, uh, and help as it, help form a tool to increase awareness of guidelines like this as ways to um, that will hopefully equate to behavior change. So here's the graphic, and then here it is on display at um, on the door of Morro Bay Paddle Sports, which is a one of our uh, certified participants that does a really great job of orient orienting their um, customers. For some, fostering a sense of empathy is an essential component of behavior change. I have moved from a very staunch position against anthropomorphism, which is the attribution of human qualities to non-human animals. Uh, to one that embraces an acknowledgement of the many similarities we share with our mammal cousins in particular, similarities like the challenges of motherhood that can generate um, relatability, empathy, and a relatable form of caring and a desire and a motivator to protect. However, this is dependent on our value system and how we position, our, position ourselves relative to the other organisms in the world. Our sea otters are neighbors. 
from an ecologist standpoint, they are part of our ecosystem if we live on the coast, certainly. What about our community? Merriam-Webster defines community as a unified body of individuals. What are some of the ways we are unified with sea otters? Sea otters are part of our community. They're working hard to make a living along the central California coast. And under that umbrella, they are deserving of our care, consideration, and stewardship as, as any of our other neighbors are, depending on your environmental identity. Valuation is tough. In what manner do you place value, monetary or otherwise, on sea otters, or more broadly, a healthy coast, coastal ecosystem? Within this one question lies the ultimate challenge of not only, not only fostering stewardship, but defining coexistence. So this might include the ecological benefit of sea otters as keystone species. The keystone species is one that have especially great impacts on community structure despite low numbers or biomass. So little critter, big impact. If keystone species are removed, the community changes greatly. So this is based on the architectural concept of a, of a stone arch. If you remove that red center keystone, the arch collapses. I would like to recommend, again, another recommendation is the video, Some Animals Are More Equal Than Others, which you can access on YouTube, which is a great overview of uh, keystone species and this top-down ecology from some of the original scientists who developed, uh, who conducted the science and defined those concepts. I love this quote from US Fish and Wildlife Service Southern Sea Otter Recovery Coordinator Lillian Carswell, really lucky to have her um, looking out for the sea otters in California. With the near extinction of sea otters during the fur trade, our coastal ecosystems were radically downgraded and simplified. The organism sea otters had evolved alongside suddenly lost the main predator that kept them in check. Subsequent generations of Californians didn't know anything else, but as sea otters reclaim their historic range, I expect we will continue to discover far-reaching ecological effects that we hadn't anticipated. The truth is, we don't even really know what we're missing. Each resident or visitor to sea otter habitat will have their own environmental identity. Environmental identity is how one views oneself in relation to the natural world. And I was really just introduced to this concept during our uh, California Coastal Wildlife Disturbance Symposium in November, where Claudia Tibbs uh, spoke about Latino outdo outdoors and really introduced me and many of the attendees to this concept. It's part of the way in which one forms his or her self-concept and a sense of connection to some part of the non-human natural environment based on their personal history, their emotional attachment, or some other similarity. The, this is a question uh, that I just pulled from a, a stakeholder survey that we've been conducting about sea otter, sea otter reintroductions. And you can see we had some different choices here for how people define their dependence on Pacific coastal resources, livelihood, cultural, enjoyment, existence value is a really tricky one to, to pin down or, or define or ecosystem services. And this is surely not an exhaustive or mutually exclusive list, but I think it's a really important concept for people to consider about themselves. What is your environmental identity? By now you may be realizing, or you already realize that the success of coexistence lies in how we manage sea otters and, and less in how we manage sea otters and more in how we change human behavior. And one of the things that I've found and that has really been reinforced, especially during the pandemic, uh, is that people are gonna do what they want to do. So my job then becomes, our job becomes, to change what it is they want to do. And that is really hard and it takes time. Past measures to reduce disturbance to wildlife and improve coexistence have often been centered on managing the wildlife and managing uh, using our knowledge of animal behavior, fence them out, fence them in, scare them away, remove them, relocate them. Increasingly though, uh, strategies are focusing more on human behavior 
to improve management of hu human wildlife interactions. However, managing human behavior requires skills and knowledge uh, from fields that I'm not skilled in, such as social psychology, communication, interpretation. I'm learning uh, that, that in order to make sea otter savvy work, I have to gain a little bit of knowledge in all of those areas. And here we can just see a kayak group. This is a guided uh, group with um, Monterey Bay kayaks, and they're demonstrating that they are a good role model by rafting up and keeping their distance while they give their orientation about sea otters. Community stewardship involves community members in an active conservation effort. The certification and recognition strategy we employ with our Community Active Wildlife Stewards program, that's CAUSE, is social marketing. And it's a process that applies marketing principles and techniques to create and communicate and deliver value in order to influence target audience behaviors that benefit society. And that's the definition from a paper on social marketing techniques by Kotler, Lee, and Rothschild, 2006. Social marketing integrates skills and theory from these fields to improve the adoption of pro-environmental behaviors. The social marketing concept leads with the idea that benefits to businesses and benefits to wildlife contribute to benefit the overall community. Another form of community engagement is community science programs, formerly known as citizen science. Community science involves communities in research, increases awareness and empathy, and creates role models. At Sea Otter Savvy, our community science team members receive training, they make observations, they collect the data that you've seen me present um, some results from today. Um, they help inform our understanding of human disturbance to sea otters, track trends in distur disturbance across time and space, engage the effectiveness of the tactics we employ. And in turn, they share their knowledge and experience with others in the community, and they themselves become role models. So how does this all come together? So we start out with that concept of awareness. Where are the two ways we can go with awareness? We can teach about the, how sea otters are recovering, how they're important ecosystem services uh, by being a keystone species, that they're ac actually quite vulnerable to our disturbance and they're so accessible. Or we can promote, promote the notion, which is false, that they're so cute. Well, maybe it's true that they're cute when they hold hands, but uh, wild sea otters rarely, rarely, rarely do this. So how does that impact behavior change? I would argue that the right hand side has no impact on behavior change or stewardship. Whereas awareness on the other side can increase empathy, change how we value sea otters and hopefully increase stewardship, which is the ultimate goal of all of these measures. What can you do? You can learn. And those of you that are here today, you are really doing a great job of that. If you're interested in one particular thing, learn all that you can about that thing. And I do recommend even trying out some scientific journal articles. Um, you can always email me if you want a copy of a, a, a journal article. I, can, I have a pretty big library I can share. Um, you can tackle them. They're not too bad once you get used to, to reading them. Expand your empathy, expand your definition of community and neighborhood and the creatures that you uh, empathize with. Expand your definition of community. Find your passion, find your one thing and go all in in protecting or conserving or promoting that one thing. Be the change, I'm gonna steal a little bit from Gandhi there. Be the change you wanna see in the world. It can start with you. The most beautiful aspect of the solution is that it is within each of us. It is within the power of every individual visiting sea otter habitat to make a difference simply by demonstrating respect for sea otters and all wildlife, giving them space, leaving no trace of your presence behind. 
that central question, what kind of neighbors will we be to other species remains unanswered. I have to believe that we can choose to coexist with sea otters in a way that preserves their intrinsic wildness. I have to believe that the most beloved of species can be allowed space in the world to live. Tell you a little bit about the Sea Otter Savvy program. You can read our mission statement there. In spring of 2014, a working group composed of members from California's Southern Sea Otter Research Alliance was formed to address the issue of marine recreation and sea otter dis disturbance. Sea Otter Savvy is a product of this working group and many of the members of that working group continue to serve as program advisors. It was conceived as a way to incorporate outreach techniques with a system of good stewardship recognition, that's our cause program, as a way to recruit the community as active participants in creating a new social norm of responsible behavior around wildlife. So if Sea Otter Savvy really does its job and meets all of our goals, I won't be necessary anymore. Communities will have taken it on and will be doing all of the stewardship work themselves. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We do conduct research and outreach. And you can see um, our website right there. Actually, I'll come back to the website in a second. Um, we are part of a new collaboration of agencies, NGOs, businesses, and others in a Respect Wildlife project. Respect Wildlife sponsors our annual Wildlife Disturbance Symposium, and it's just beginning to be a tangible presence on social media. And with this new website that you can visit, um, please stop by the website and have a look uh, at and become familiar with this pretty impressive collaboration, respect-wildlife.org. Here's an example of one of the first graphics produced by Respect Wildlife, and it's building on both awareness, sea otters see humans as threatening and scary, and empathy, how would you feel if you were in that circumstance? So we want to produce materials that are engaging, attention grabbing, and also transmit a message successfully. And this is a little video that was done, made by Cal Poly students. Um, that is part of the Respect Wildlife Library of materials. Oh my gosh, look, it's an otter. Let's go touch it. Respect our existence, keep your distance. And I apologize, that's actually the old logo. There's an updated logo, which you can see on, um, on the website. And finally, I have to thank the Central Coast State Parks Association for allowing me to, to put in a little plug for fundraising. Um, so those of you that may, may wish to support the work Sea Outer Savvy does, this is a really good time. We're a small organization with a little, very little overhead and we're very efficient with funds. There's a Monterey County Gives fundraiser that runs through December and it's an easy way to support us. You don't need to be a Monterey County resident to donate. So that's my little plug for fundraising. Um, here's some important websites where you can learn more, seaottersavvy.org, respect-wildlife.org. And if you're on social media, please follow us at Sea Otter Savvy. Here's some of the hashtags we use. Tag us in your posts about sea otters um, and respecting wildlife. We love to see those. And then here's just some folks to thank. Sea Otter Savvy has advisors from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, USGS, um, and Hydra Ecological uh, helps us with our data and statistics. We have funding support, project partners, research affiliates. We really are a program that depends on collaboration and partnership and working with others because we're very small. So the way we extend our reach and our effect is by um, partnering with other organizations. And that is all I have. So I guess I'll go ahead and stop share. Is that, does that sound good? Well, yeah. We we can stop sharing and let's see what came in here for us. Um, I made it under 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question. 
in the chat. Um, while fishing along coastal beaches, I have been approached. I have been approached otters and appear to simply hang out, often coming up onto the rocks I have been on. Are they saying, hey, you are in my space? Or, hi, I'm here too. In all cases, I give them their space. That's a good call. Yeah. That's a good call. Yeah, definitely a good call. So I think the question, the person was saying that when they're out and about, they will occasionally encounter sea otters. So we're talking the guys with the the flippers, the paws on the front and the flippers on the back uh, up on the beach or rocks. And um, so hauling out is, is what how we refer to that. When sea otters come ashore, we say they're hauling out. It is a normal behavior uh, for sea otters uh, in general. Um, I will, on the commander islands in the winter time when all the kelp is knocked out, almost all of the sea otters, thousands of them are all hauled out on the beach. But in California, because they're so, so crowded, they're pretty picky about where they haul out. So if you are walking down a beach, a, a public beach, and you see an otter on the sand, um, that otter's probably not um, hauling out just out of normal behavior. It probably isn't feeling so good. So if you see anything that you think is suspicious, you can call um, the Marine Mammal Center. I don't know if Mike Harris is here on the on the um, in the webinar today or or um, Heather Harris, but uh, there's folks with CDFW that can um, also respond to those. But I think the the easiest thing to do is to call the Marine Mammal Center if you're con if you're concerned and um, give them plenty of space. And if you're really good, you'll stick around and discourage others from approaching that animal, um, and especially people with dogs. Um, so in a nutshell, hauling out is a normal behavior. Again, back to this guy here in the pickleweed and Elkhorn Slough. Um, but in places where like that on a public beach, it's probably a, a sign the animal's not doing well and you need to call someone an expert. Don't try to pick them up and put them in your bathtub, please. Okay, and I don't know if you saw this one come into the Q&A. Suzanne no. is asking, how can you ask people not to not disturb the otters? I was at Moss Landing last month and children were fishing and dropping fishing line right next to the otters. So that seems like a basic question, but it's it's really the answer is really complicated. So my first tip is to always be careful about your own personal safety when approaching others. Um, there is this sort of phenomenon right now. I don't know if it's defined in any scientific way, but this sort of the COVID syndrome, where there seems people seem to perhaps respond. Um, more intensively in, when approached than other times. Um, so you always wanna think about your own personal safety and whether you wanna compromise that. That being said, establishing a social norm of respecting wildlife relies on this pressure from your peers. That's really the foundation of it. Everyone else is doing this and I don't feel comfortable if I'm not joining everyone else in respecting wildlife. So it really does, um, rely on that sort of public pressure. So if you can do so in a safe and friendly manner, um, you can always say, hey, do you know these otters? It's really important that they get their rest. Um, I try never to yell at anyone. If you can't have a um, two-way conversation that's educational, I don't recommend just shouting at someone. They're just going to resent you and not have a good impression of the entire experience, um, but try to have a positive interaction and discussion with them. Um, the other thing I wanna address is you, you have to be sure that someone is really doing something that is harmful or prohibited. So someone fishing near the raft when they're at the, T the South Tee Pier in Morro Bay or at Target Rock, they aren't doing anything wrong. Um, those are popular fishing spots. If they entangle an otter, someone will have to respond. Um, and I will admit that I'm holding my breath when I see those fishing lines going in right near, near foraging otters. Um, but those 
folks are our users are valid users of that area and we just hope that they use caution the best thing they can do is not leave their errant their broken pieces of fishing line and fishing hooks around so um, i also often get um, emails and reports from people about disturbances um, and what they're describing is someone getting uh, within what they would define as too close of a distance and i often ask um, were the otters reacting? And um, and then do you have video? So it's important to, to, it's hard to define what's too close sometimes. Sometimes it's obvious and you'll see the whole raft flush. Other times what looks like it's too close to you may not actually be that close because of some optical um, situation. And you know if the otters aren't reacting, the habituation um, is, is a whole other issue that we probably don't have time to discuss, but um, I probably can't make any call to a vendor, a business, if, if I am talking about a raft that has not even opened an eyeball because their, their craft is a little bit close. So, you know, defining what is a harmful activity and what is a prohibited activity is pretty tricky um, and kind of have to take that on your own, but become familiar with that by visiting our website or following us on social media. Sorry, that was a ram. That's one of my rambling answers. No, that was good though. <laughs> and then um, Ryan in the chat, he added that Leave No Trace has some excellent resources for addressing um, outdoor behavior in non confrontational manners. So. Yeah, we actually had a whole workshop on this um, during our wildlife disturbance symposium this year. That's not quite up on our um, our YouTube, Sea Otter Savvy YouTube. All the other talks from the wildlife disturbance symposium are up on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to Sea Otter Savvy on YouTube, you'll you'll find those. But the two workshops I have to I still have to upload, and one of those was all about it was by Jim Cavell, who's retired from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, who's sort of the guru of of animal of interpretation on wildlife issues, and he really specifically addressed and gave some suggestions for how to talk to people about this thing. But I think um, a, an aggressive interaction um, almost never works. Even the kindest, um, most thoughtful, prepared um, interjections are often met with hostility. So it's it's a tricky one, it's a tricky one. Even if you're in a uniform, I think it's, it's, it's challenging these days. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We had um, something in the chat. Betty brought up the uh, Sea Life Stewards program, the volunteer program in San Luis Obispo Coast District. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I can't remember who is leading. I don't know who would be people's contact if you're all if you're interested in volunteering for the sea life stewards program. Um, it might be Robin Chase. Um, so it used to be Cara O'Brien and she's um, changed jobs. So I think Robin Chase might be um, with state parks. Yeah, okay, okay. She might be a good contact and um, yeah, they're great. So they're doing on the water outreach in Morro Bay where they're in the same craft as the, the, the source of the majority of disturbance. So I, I probably don't need to say that according to our data, the vast majority of human caused disturbance to sea otters is caused by kayaks. I probably, everyone probably already realizes that, but the data support that, that assumption. Um, and then up here in the Monterey Bay area, we have Team Ocean, which is um, a, uh, sanctuaries, National Marine Sanctuaries uh, program that does a very similar thing in Elkhorn Slough and along Cannery Row um, with people on the water doing outreach. Really great program. So if you're able to support either of them in any way, um, I think you can, I think you can donate to either. I'm putting Robin Chase's contact info in the chat now, let's see. Yeah, they might be 
maybe Betty knows they might be recruiting now for new team members. Um, I'm not sure if they've already, I don't think they've already done it. All the years run together now, so I don't I know. <laughs> sure they haven't no. done it for this year. Um, and, like, and I knew, I knew Robin was kind of the lead over there, but I couldn't remember who was specifically assigned to Sea Life Stewards. It was someone who I thought didn't work there anymore, but, but anyways, Robin can get you where you need to go. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it was, it was an Jenny, um, uh, I'm spacing yeah. with Robin Hat. It was Jenny and then it was Robin Hazard. And yeah. it might still be Robin Hazard. Um, but Robin Chase will be able to direct you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I bet he says they will be starting again in the spring. So Perfect. this is a good time. Actually, Sea Otter Savvy will be recruiting volunteers for both our community science and our outreach. Um, and we want to start doing more in-person outreach. So we'll be recruiting this year for people who will be out in the field conducting outreach onshore um, at stations, at, at specific stations. So if you're interested, definitely, uh, maybe you can pop my email in there because I um, would love to hear from people that are interested in volunteering. I can get you on the list. Yeah, let me get that, let's see. Okay, well. You, um, welcome questions anytime. Um, so please feel free to use my email, uh, my seattersavvy.org email. I love to answer your questions, maybe in the subject line put, or in the, yeah, in the subject line put um, in qu question about sea otters. And um, if, you, if you want any, I mentioned about learning, if you want to have access to some uh, scientific publications that are currently blocked by a paywall now you have to pay to, to get them if you're not associated with an academic institution um, I can provide those to you and I do encourage you can read the abstract you can read the discussion you know kind of break it down into little pieces and there's usually still some interesting information in there that you can understand you just can skip the complex models and the methods <laughs> unless you like that kind of thing maybe you'll get into it uh. Well, this was great. We had some wonderful questions and comments, some great conversation. Thanks so much for being here with us today and presenting all this material. I, I learned a lot and um, I know our viewers enjoyed it too, judging by these comments. <laughs> Let's see, and you know what? I'm gonna put the intro slide up one more time just in case anyone missed it in the very beginning. So this has some good information on it and um, if you're new to the program, when you close out of the Zoom window today, a little survey will pop up. Um, it's very short. If you wouldn't mind filling it out for us, uh, we do read the survey results and um, it helps us kind of reformat our programs if we need to make some changes. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.